Hello, this is Brett from Survival Comms, and this is another InFed Half Wave Antenna Transformer video. And about a week ago, I did another video on testing different types of InFed Half Wave Antenna Transformers, looking for one that has the least insertion loss. And the one that had the least insertion loss, I've now mounted up onto a piece of acrylic material. Now this is the same acrylic material I used to construct universal antenna insulators and I've done a video on that in the past too. The stuff's extremely inexpensive and it's very easy to work with. So what we're going to do in this video is we're going to go ahead and discuss how this is mounted. We're going to go ahead and put an antenna element on this and we're going to run some tests on it. Another thing we're going to talk about is the low leak capacitor. What happens when you leave the capacitor out of this antenna transformer design? Does it make a difference? What happens if you use one type of capacitor versus another type of capacitor? Is there a difference in performance? So let's get started. Well you can see here how I've mounted my transformer up on the acrylic sheet. I've built several of these out of the acrylic material that was left over from my antenna insulator project that I did a video on in the past. Just used a couple zip ties to secure the transformer on there. I have it offset from the acrylic material with some small pieces of servo tape and some fiberglass tape on top of that and that basically keeps our transformer level. I've got an SO239 connector here. You can see our antenna side goes on this side to the binding post right here and this right here is a small connection for our return or counterpoise whatever term you want to use. And you can see that we have this capacitor on here. We're going to be testing different configurations of capacitors in this video. Now with this arrangement, you can see it's really easy to attach our antenna element. Just use that small carabiner. It's been on our binding post. Tighten it up. Our strain relief in this example is nothing more than a piece of dummy cord that I've got tied with a Prusik. And that provides plenty of strain relief for our antenna element. The antenna element we're going to use for our testing is just a 40 meter antenna element, 66 feet of 18 gauge wire. I do have a compensation coil in this particular one. I just made that out of a piece of PVC, wound it six times over a one inch PVC with the antenna element wire, and then this heat shrinked it up. And it does help at the uh, 10 meter band and higher frequencies to bring your frequencies back uh, this particular element is cut for the voice portion of the band and not the CW portion of the band. And at the opposite end, I just chopped up some old PVC pipe with my bandsaw, and I use that as an insulator. I just tie a bowl in around this insulator, and then I have another one of those connectors on here. And that allows me to tie another bowl in with an antenna element wire, and then just go ahead and make a connection here. So again, how we would accomplish adding length to our element. We just go ahead and tie a bowl in. Around our element. Like that. Tighten it on here. And you can see that we're strain relieved and we have a positive electrical connection between our antenna elements. And again, add 22 feet to a 40 meter infed half wave element, and you have a 60 meter antenna, and add 66 feet to a 40 meter half wave element, and you'll have a 80 meter antenna. Very simple. And here's our counterpoise return, whatever term you want to use. You can see we have the male version of the connector here, and it just basically plugs in like that. I leave a alligator clip on the other end of it in case I want to clip it to a fence or something of that nature. And this is what we're going to be using in testing this. And we're going to be setting this up in an elevated feed configuration. The feed line we're going to use for our testing is just 50 foot of RG223 with the integrated sleeve choke. I've done a video on this before. The choke is installed two meters away from the feed point of the antenna. It's a well, now that we've discussed the configuration of the device, let's go ahead and talk about capacitors. For capacitors, we're going to test the transformer without any capacitors. We're going to test them with a 100 picofarad, 10 kilovolt capacitor, and this is just the generic 
eBay ones that you see for sale. And these things are about $1.50 a piece. And then these, which are the TDK capacitors that are 120 picofarad, three kilovolt capacitors. And this is the part number here. And I got these from Digikey for 43 cents each. Well, let's go ahead and check the capacitance of our capacitors. This is our eBay 10 kilovolt, 100 picofarad. And we're looking at around 83 picofarad is the value. And this is our 120 picofarad TDK capacitor here. And we can see that it is 102.1 picofarads. Well, let's do some transformer sweeps. This represents our two transformers back to back. So the numbers you see on here represent the loss across two devices. Have that loss and you have the loss across one device. So this is the transformers with no capacitors whatsoever. So at 80 meters, we're looking at just under 1 dB across both devices. Same thing at 40. We're looking at almost 1.5 dB in the 20 meter band. And then when we get to 10 meters, we're minus almost 7 dB. So that's 3.5 dB across each device. And we'll talk about how this has a bearing on our SWR sweeps and why SWR sweeps are not nearly as important. Now for our second sweep, we've taken capacitor A, which is a 120 picofarad TDK capacitor, on both transformers and here are the results and it's obvious that our performance at higher frequencies is much better than it was without capacitors at all. 80 meter band were a loss of 0.97 across both devices. 40 meters 1.16 across both devices. 20 meters 1.74 across both devices and 10 meters 0.95 so we've went from almost 7 dB to 0.95 and you can see that the higher frequency performance is greatly increased with the addition of a capacitor. Now for our third sweep we've installed capacitor B on each one of our transformers. Capacitor B is the no-name 100 picofarad 10 kilovolt capacitor I got from Amazon and you can see the results here at 80 meters, we're at 0.99 dB across both devices. At 40, 1.15 dB across both devices. At 20, 1.80 dB across both devices. And at 10 meters, 2.06 dB across both devices. Well, let's discuss the data we captured with the spectrum analyzer and tracking generator sweeping the devices in their ready to be used configuration. Now, when we did the earlier sweeps in the previous video on building these transformers, we were just doing the transformers back to back naked without all of the other accoutrements that enable them to be connected to an antenna. And there was more loss exhibited having it in this configuration than having the transformers just tied straight into one another, which is not surprising at all. Our first configuration we tested was no capacitor. One thing about the no capacitor configuration that was evident was after the 20 meter band, your performance fell off rapidly. I mean, look at the loss there in the 10 meter band. We're looking at almost minus 3.5 dB, so our average is shown here. Now, below the 20 meter band, your performance was best of all, but I mean, we're splitting hairs here when we look at the difference in that. We're looking at uh, you know, less than a tenth of a dB to a tenth of a dB. So that's not tremendous. Capacitor A really was a good performer above the 20 meter band, and that was clearly evident. I mean, the difference between capacitor A and capacitor B is almost half a dB when you're talking about the 10 meter band. Actually, it's a little over half a dB in the 10 meter band, which is considerable. So we can see our averages here. So capacitor A was clearly the winner in this contest. One thing that was really interesting when I did testing with a thermal imager when I stress test these transformers in this configuration by transmitting through them for a couple of minutes at 100 watts is these little capacitors here glow like little LEDs. And the disk capacitors, which are the 3 kilovolt capacitors, there was none of that evident whatsoever.
Now let's connect the elements, hoist this puppy up in the air, and do some SWR sweeps. This is our overall SWR sweep of our 40 meter in-fed half wave with the 66 foot antenna element equipped with a compensation coil and a 12 foot counterpoise. The feed point is elevated to 22 foot and the radiator is completely horizontal and secured to a 22 foot anchor point. Now everyone loves SWR sweeps, but they only show a segment of the overall picture. When you first look at this, you might say, well, there does not seem to be a tremendous difference at the points of resonance and performance if you were merely following the SWR sweep alone. This similarity in the traces is due to the effect of system loss, and we will discuss this briefly after we zoom in on the sweeps band by band. We are zoomed in on the 40 meter band and you can see the performance across the 40 meter band is rather good and it's just about where we would want it to be. Again, this antenna element is cut for the phone portion of the band and looks like all is bueno. Now we're looking at our 20 meter band and one thing you'll note is that the no capacitor configuration is resonant at a point several hundred kilohertz higher than our configurations featuring a capacitor. And this is something or a phenomenon that you're going to see throughout the rest of our band sweeps. One thing also to note is, is if we could get that 20 meter band to be about 150 kilohertz lower, it would be ideal. Now that's the purpose of the compensation coil, which is that little small coil that's six feet away from our feed point. And its effect is not nearly as profound you know, just above the 40 meter band. If I had an 80 meter element on this, you would probably see that adjusted downward right where we want it to be. And here we are looking at the 15 meter band. And again, our capacitor equipped configurations is pretty much perfect for this band. Now you'll notice that capacitor B seems to have better performance than capacitor A as far as if you're strictly looking at it from an SWR standpoint and that's what I'm talking about. That's due to loss and we're going to talk about that once we finish doing the sweeps here. And now we're in the 10 meter band and you can see our performance is shown here and of course I would like the uh, resonant point to be a few hundred kilohertz lower in frequency. That's something that I would have hoped the compensation coil would have achieved but then again, maybe I just need to do some more experimentation with that and coil configuration, etc., etc. Perhaps using the 80 meter element will bring it right where we want to. I've set this up to demonstrate how system loss has an effect on SWR measurement. So for our model system we have here, we have 50 foot of RG223 that has 8 tenths of a dB of loss and a transformer that has 1 dB of loss and this is at a frequency of 14 megahertz for our model. To our left you can see our transceiver is hooked to a short jumper to our SWR meter. If we're talking about an antenna analyzer it could basically be both of those combined together. Now our piece of test equipment, our SWR meter in this particular example here, is measuring 10 watts of forward power and that is the measurement reference for that particular piece of equipment. So as our RF goes down through our cable and through our transformer, it's encountering 1.8 dB of loss. So the power that's actually going to the antenna is 6.6 .6 watts and not 10 watts. Now we have an antenna that basically has a theoretical match of 1.5 and that's going to give us a reflection of three tenths of a watt. Now that three tenths of a watt is going to go back through that transformer on the way back and back through that section of feed line encountering that same 1.8 dB of loss which leaves us with two tenths of a watt of reflected power at the SWR meter and comparing that to that reference of 10 watts forward is going to show us an SWR of 1.3 to 1. Now you may think that this is splitting hairs here, and perhaps so in this particular example, but as the loss in our transformer increases and as frequency increases, this effect becomes much more profound. Now as far as measurement is concerned, it would be easy to say, well Brett, you just need to enter the cable loss and loss across the transformer into your piece of test equipment. They would be 100% correct in saying that. However, first of all, most end users of this equipment have no idea this is even an issue. 
And second, not all test equipment has the capability of doing such. You know, the SWR meter on your radio or tuner or a run-of-the-mill SWR meter or some less expensive analyzers do lack this capability. Third, you have to know the actual loss across your cable and devices under test before you can accurately enter that data, and that is my purpose in creating this content in the first place. Again, I'm not trying to sell anything. Let's perform an experiment to demonstrate this. We have an antenna analyzer hooked to a step attenuator terminated in a 2 to 1 mismatch load and we're tuned to the 10 meter band. Uh, what we're going to do is, is we're going to emulate the capacitorless variant which exhibited a loss of 3.5 dB across one device. And as we talked about before, whenever you're measuring SWR, it's measuring the forward power in relationship to the return power. So your return power is also factored into this. So if we go ahead and apply 3.5 times 2, which is 7 dB of attenuation, we can see the result here. So we went from a 2 to a 1.2. Well, now we have a pretty clear understanding of how insertion loss has an impact on our SWR measurement and why whenever you watch other content and you see people doing SWR sweeps without discussing the insertion loss of an antenna system that's using a transformer, it's not giving you a complete picture of performance. In other content in the past, I've talked about and shown exactly how much insertion loss has an impact on your transmitted signal. Well, now let's see how it's going to affect your receive signal. Let's do a little demonstration about how loss affects our receive. We're injecting a signal into this SDR. I'm going to step through various levels of attenuation. We'll be able to hear in real time just how this affects a generated signal. going to do a performance comparison between an infed half wave antenna utilizing this transformer versus our control antenna the ZS6 BKW. Here are the results from running Whisper for a period of 30 minutes on 40 meters and 20 meters comparing my infed half wave build as shown against the ZS6 BKW. The radio use was my home built micro bit running 5 watts no tuner was used. I was pleased with these results as a ZS6 BKW, although making more contacts, is over 10 feet higher in elevation and is fed with only 9 feet of LMR400 directly to the window line. Now mind you, the ZS6 BKW is a full-sized center-fed antenna as well. For an in-fed antenna fed with 50 foot of RG223, this was excellent performance and I personally have not built or used an in-fed antenna that performed this well before. The single sideband voice comparisons made with my IC756 Pro 3 were so close in performance that there was, in my opinion, no significant data gathered. On the 15 meter band, I worked a station in Slovenia and the Netherlands within minutes and proceeded to work several POTA stations stateside and it truly was a QRZ call to contact back to back with boring regularity. 10 meters wasn't open and the only traffic I heard were stations that were foreign language rag chews without identifying themselves and I felt by this time I had gathered enough data. Some background on what sent me down this transformer rabbit hole was over the summer we had a five-day exercise and one of the stations I was responsible for was allowing the participants to make a required witnessed HF voice contact. The antenna that I had set up for the station was a 40 meter infed half wave that I had built that used an FT24043 wound with 14 gauge magnet wire and a conventional wide spaced crossover wind with a 10 kilovolt 100 picofarad cap. The band conditions were not ideal and the students made the requisite contacts, but I felt the antenna performance was subpar in spite of performing excellently the night before during the Winlink lab, which is unfortunately the nature of HF radio. 
This is what put me in search of building a better transformer, and after finding the information put forth by MM0 OPX and Evil Lair Electronics, this led me to do this kind of experimentation, and I am so glad that I did. I used the prototype of this antenna before creating this in my previous NFED halfway video for another exercise and using a subpar setup, ground fed with a distal end at 15 foot of elevation. And this setup was used to make contacts with several other participants and squirt out several emails over Winlink and all of this was performed with ease. I would encourage you to do your own experimentation and find it out for yourself. The grass is greener when you build it yourself. I hope this helps. This is Brett from Survival Comms. Till next time.